I plan on boxing Tyson too. I think that I, I can box as good as he can, and I can punch as, if not better than Tyson. Sure. This will be a win to let everybody know that Donnie Long is back. Welcome back to When Boxing Hype Meets Reality here on Boxing Legends TV. On this series, we look back at some media hype fighters that a group of fans became consumed by and perhaps went a little overboard with. What did you think about the fight? What you, I beat him. Everybody out there know I beat him. If you've seen any of the previous four parts, you'll know that we cover a wide range of talent from championship quality fighters to club level competitors, with our primary goal always being the same, to poke fun at the fans and media rather than the guys that got in the ring. Part 4 took a dark turn and spiraled out of control, so today we'll try to lighten the mood a bit by sticking true to the series' roots, presenting four short bios displaying the rise and inevitable fall of fighters that have sparked heated debates among forums for years. If you enjoy the content around here, a thumbs up would be greatly appreciated. Here now, when boxing hype meets reality, part 5. So I deserve a round of applause. Everyone watching this on the TV, from your home, you should all clap for me. After bursting onto the British domestic scene around 2016, Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Sports quickly realized that the fast-rising prospect, O'Hara Davies, was a lucrative asset, if not for his boxing ability, certainly for his potent tongue. For my fight, my haters should just learn to love me, because they're never going to get rid of me. Bunch of drunks and bunch of guys that sit there on Twitter all day and drink beer and eat burgers. Stop talking, mate. I'll be able to get your mother to start working for me. The young man was full of confidence and backing up every word with dominant displays in the ring. However, playful comments eventually turned into nasty insults, particularly on Twitter, and as O'Hara faced more trouble in competition, the pre-fight trash talk was met by men that had their own image to protect, often triggering violent confrontations. Whoa, 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 Pretty much everyone hated O'Hara, yet with an unblemished record of 15-0, he didn't care, and he saw himself as a sort of Mayweather figure that could do and say as he wanted as long as he remained undefeated. I've got an issue with something you said earlier, so I'm talking about at 140, I'm the man, and you're trying to compare me to Tank. While O'Hara made a song and dance to try and appeal to the more casual viewers, a young man from Scotland named Josh Taylor was rising through the ranks while maintaining a more low-key profile. <laughs> Taylor was a well-rounded, accomplished amateur that was clearly above domestic level. O'Hara wasn't. He had physical gifts such as incredibly long arms and natural power that only requires limited skill to utilize to a certain level. I've got three words to say to you, Josh. Shut your mouth. You, you and all your team are bums. O'Hara acted precisely as you'd expect during the buildup. Yet on July 8th, 2017, it was time to do the talking with his fist. Being the sort of character O'Hara was, it didn't exactly surprise people when he elected to fight with the Philly Shell defense. In fact, I could probably make an entire video of Mayweather wannabes hindering themselves while trying to pull off the famed shoulder roll. Needless to say, O'Hara got schooled, suffering multiple knockdowns before eventually quitting midway through the seventh. The fans he had been attacking at press conferences and interviews were the first to twist the knife on Twitter. It's never a pretty sight to see a losing fighter trolled, but in O'Hara's case, it was inevitable. I don't think I've got any fans. You know, when I look online and look on, on my social media with the comments, it seems like everyone hates me. I'm not sure why everyone hates me, but when I lost a fight, it was like a national holiday to these guys. Josh Taylor went on to achieve great things in the sport, considered today as a top 10 pound for pound fighter in the world. So it wasn't until Davies lost another fight at British level a year later that fans realized his true level in the game. A decent boxer? Sure. A fighter worthy of harassing Floyd Mayweather to proclaim he's the second coming of Sugar Ray Robinson? Certainly not. There will never be a time in boxing where a big punching prospect doesn't capture the imagination of fans, particularly when said fighter rises during an era where elite fighters are few and far between. And we're looking to fight, we'll fight anybody. I mean, we want to fight somebody to step up to another level. That's the most important thing. Hailing from South Africa with an alleged amateur record of 72 fights, 72 wins, all coming by way of first round knockout, heavyweight Courage Shabalala had many fans and even highly respected pundits completely sold on the possibility that we could be witnessing the rise of a fighter with George Foreman type potential. Oh, what a body shot by Courage. And this fight's going to be over, Arnie, very quickly. As a pro, a promising talent. At least that's what we were led to believe from the limited film that was available. 
HBO, the leading boxing network globally, took a chance on Chabalala and matched him mildly against Brian Scott on a pay-per-view undercard in 1996. And he is one of the best young and natural punchers I've seen come along in the heavyweight division in a very long time. The pre-fight feature was legendary, precisely the sort of hype media that HBO became known and often criticized for in the future, selling diehard fans a dream with some tantalizing commentary over rare pieces of footage. As Frank pointed out, he has the kind of explosive punching power which is in itself a natural charisma for a fighter. And Shabalala going to the body relentlessly here in the first minute of the fight. Courage looked every bit as promising as the pre-fight feature for the first three or four minutes, landing some decent combinations to Scott's midsection. But then, to the shock of many, in the very first instance he had to defend himself from a Scott attack, everything came crashing down. Shabalala takes a hard right hand inside by Scott, and Shabalala is stunned, and now Scott is landing a series of right hands, and this is getting dangerous for Courage Shabalala, and that, that's it! Courage Shabalala has been knocked out by Brian Scott. When you have a puncher's reputation, a second chance is never far away. And in Shabalala's case, that came just a year later when he matched up with the ever-dangerous Daryl Wilson on USA's Tuesday Night Fights. This time around, the fans got to see some of that fame punching power in action as Courage knocked down Wilson twice in the opening two rounds. Yet, the pressure of an opponent's attack, albeit a desperate one for Wilson, became too much for Courage to handle once again, reluctant to continue after absorbing a few clean shots. Courage went on to lose a further two times before retiring with an underwhelming record of 26-4 in 2005. In the early months of 2009, Showtime Boxing got fans excited when they announced a new group and knockout style tournament to establish the best fighter at 168 pounds. Hey, that's great! Where's Arthur? That's great! That's great! That's great! The six fighters that entered were WBA champion Mikkel Kessler, WBC champion Carl Froch, 2004 Olympic gold medalist Andre Ward, and formidable contenders Jermaine Taylor, Arthur Abraham, and Andre Durrell. A mouth-watering selection for fans, yet there was one notable absentee. as the 10-to-1 outsider Andre Ward defeated Carl Froch in the final to establish himself as not only the best fighter at super middleweight, but a worthy entrant to the ring's pound-for-pound -pound ranking. During the tournament, Boutet's team promised the fans he'd face the outright winner of the Super 6 to prove that his 30-0 record and six-year reign as champion was legitimate despite the subpar opposition. Yet, to the surprise of Andre Ward, who quite honestly could have done with another big fight to build upon his newly found reputation, Boutte signed a two-fight deal with a second-place finisher, Carl Froch, and before long, the Romanian was in Nottingham expected to brush past the Iron Chin veteran. Boxing, has Boutte as number one in the world, even above Andre Ward. He's going to have to do it earlier. Boutte can't get himself close. Good right hand from Froch. on the sideline anyway. Hammers in right hand to left. His legs are gone. Boutte got absolutely steamrolled, obliterated. Froch pounced on his wounded prey and scored one of the most destructive knockouts of the century. And, uh, you know, we're contracted to go and rematch on uh, Lucian Boutte. We'll do it in a heartbeat. You know, that was a comprehensive beating. Evidently, Boutte wanted no part of the rematch, and the Romanian sought refuge back in Canada, where he went on to lose four of his last six fights before retiring in 2017. <laughs> I feel like 90% of this series consists of heavyweights. And that's not me picking on the fame money division. It's just the category that has the most eyeballs on it, inevitably creating more hype around rising prospects. Do 
Dwayne Bobek. Where do I even start with this guy? In an era where Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, Ken Norton, and George Foreman were all top dogs, the biased sports media, shall I say, tried to create yet another pitiful narrative of a rising white hope during a period where racial exclusivity was heading in the right direction and felt unnecessary due to the thriving nature of the sport. Bobek had every characteristic of a hype job, undefeated with a puncher's record against local bin men and firefighters, but was being pushed towards the dangerous four without any outings to prove he was worthy. To Bobek's credit, he did have genuine boxing skill, at least as an amateur, where the 6'3 Minnesotian defeated both Larry Holmes and Teofilo Stevenson. Yet, the warning signs of a weak chin were evident as he often suffered brutal KO defeats whenever he was matched against a renowned power puncher. So, what did the boxing world decide was the best first step up for Bobek? Ken Norton, of course, the man who had just broken Muhammad Ali's jaw and bodied his last eight opponents inside the distance. The favorite against Dwayne Bobek, and we find out tonight the so-called great white hope of Dwayne Bobek, how good is he? Of each round, the preceding round, and we're going the first to 12. He would deliver it more, he does in his sparring, but he can't oh, boy, there's that overhand right, and that hurt Bobek! Run by that looping overhand right, and Bobek is the... Bobby, 52 seconds. 52 seconds is all it took for the clear discrepancy in skill to present itself. Did the boxing media learn its lesson? Of course not. A young man named Jerry Cooney was making his way through the ranks, and he fit the profile perfectly.